Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the Washington Institute for Near East Policy. Uh, I'm Matthew Levitt. I direct the Stein Program in Counterterrorism and Intelligence. And I welcome you to the latest in our ongoing counterterrorism lecture series, today discussing Hezbollah's terror army, how to prevent a third Lebanon war. Before we get going, I'm going to lead by example and silence my phone, and I'll, I'll ask you all to, to please do the same. We are very fortunate to have with us today uh, three members of a high-level military group uh, who participated in a study that led, in a research trip, that is, that led to the publication of the study uh, by the same title of our event. Uh, General Klaus uh, Naumann is the former chief of staff of the German uh, Bundeswehr and served as chairman of the NATO Military Committee. General Lord Richard Danat is the former chief of the general staff of the British Army and a member of the House of Lords. And Colonel Richard Kemp is former commander of British forces in Afghanistan, and he led, among other things, the international terrorism team of Britain's Joint uh, Intelligence uh, Committee, uh, the JIC. It's a very timely uh, conversation uh, for many reasons. Uh, just today, uh, Israel uh, un leaked, Israeli leaders apparently leaked to the Israeli press uh, the name of the uh, Hezbollah commander, formerly in South Lebanon and now believed to be commanding uh, Hezbollah forces in, the, in southern Syria, in particular on the Syrian side of the Golan Heights, Munir Ali Naim Shaiti. Um, and this is clearly an effort to engage in not just non-kinetic but non-operational activities to kind of further entrench deterrence, out some of the individuals involved in this activity. Uh, they went into quite a bit of detail, which is available uh, online, on his background, his biography. And that's not the only uh, piece of information that's been made public recently. Here in the United States, the United States government released uh, rewards for justice uh, amounts for two Hezbollah leaders. The first time rewards for justice has been used uh, regarding Hezbollah in a decade. The two individuals that were um, listed, one was Talal Hamia, who's currently the head of Hezbollah's international terrorist wing, the ESO or the IJO, it's the same thing, uh, succeeding uh, his friend and mentor, Imad Mugnia. And the other is Fuad Shukr, Fuad Shukr is uh, perhaps more relevant uh, to the issue of today's discussion, not in charge of the international uh, terrorist wing of the organization, but a member of the highest military body within Hezbollah, uh, the Jihad Council. He's a longtime senior advisor, according to the State Department, on military affairs to Hezbollah's Secretary General, Hassan Nasrallah, uh, and is the military commander of Hezbollah forces in southern Lebanon, among other things. There has clearly been a war of words between Israel and Hezbollah, uh, with Israel concerned about the, at a minimum, 100,000 rockets and other projectiles in Hezbollah's arsenal, which I would suggest has not, Hezbollah is not collecting to serve as paperweights. And with Hezbollah concerned that Israel might do something preemptively as they are deeply entrenched in Syria, and may not be as prepared as they'd like to be to fight a, a two-pronged battle. When Nasrallah says that the road to Jerusalem runs through Damascus, many joke that he's just not very good at geography. And while it may be true that neither Israel nor Hezbollah want a war in the immediate, there's always the chance for miscalculation. And in the medium to long term, the likelihood of another conflict is quite high. So I'm very, very pleased to be able to host uh, this senior delegation of uh, European military officials to come and share with us some of the findings uh, from their report. Uh, we will uh, hear from each of them, and then we will open the floor to questions and answers. Uh, Colonel Kemp, the floor is yours. We'll do that, and we'll do Q&A from here, if that's okay. okay. Well, thank you very much indeed, Matthew. It's always a Great pleasure to be here in the colonies, and, um, <laughs> and in particular at the Washington Institute. Um, I always avoid mentioning when I'm in Washington that my regiment was instrumental in burning down the White House in 1814, because um, it's obviously a sensitive issue for Americans. We don't like to remind you. And um, General Dannett tells me that his regiment was not here in 
the War of 1812, so you don't need to aim your ire at him. Um, <clears throat> the, the report we've written has writ been written on behalf of the high-level military group. We're representing that group today. The high-level military group was assembled by the Friends of Israel Initiative, and the Friends of Israel Initiative is chaired by Jose Maria Aznar, former president of Spain. It is made up of um, a number of former heads of state, such as Stephen Harper from Canada and John Howard from Australia, foreign and defense ministers from Europe, from the United States, from Latin America, from Australia, India, and elsewhere, if there is anywhere else. I'm not sure there is, but um, certainly covering the major parts of the world. Um, and, and what we've embarked upon is a program to try and enlighten people um, through the high-level military group um, uh, to, uh, to, to enlighten them on the realities of warfare in an era where uh, the West's ability to carry out effective military operations against insurgents is constantly under attack. And the high-level military group, made up of retired um, senior generals predominantly from around the world, uh, has carried out a number of studies um, into different aspects of warfare. For example, the Gaza conflict, the last Gaza conflict, uh, a comparative study also of conflicts and campaigns around the world, and the latest being this report on um, the threat from Hezbollah, which we're presenting to you today. Um, I think what, we, what we're proposing in this report is, as a result of our findings, is that the West has a unique opportunity to actually stop a war from happening before it starts. And as Matthew suggested, the, the probability of, of uh, war initiated by Hezbollah in Lebanon is high. We should not forget the history of Lebanon, what it's all about. And of course, in 1983, one of, Le one of Hezbollah's first major offensive aggressive operations directed by Iran was to kill 241 American servicemen in Beirut on the same day, 58 French servicemen in Beirut. During the Iraq conflict and Afghanistan, Hezbollah killed over 1,000, sorry, Hezbollah, the IRGC, and other Iranian elements killed over 1,000 American servicemen and many uh, British and other allied forces fighting in Afghanistan and in Iraq. The majority of those casualties were in Iraq. So we should be under no illusion about what this organization is and what it does. It's one of the main proxy instruments of Iran directed against Iran's enemies, which of course include Israel and the United States of America and the US as allies. So this is a chance perhaps to, um, to do something about that war before the war begins. And I can, as the, the generals will explain, when the war begins, there's little doubt that Israel will have to act with immense aggression, immense force, immense decisiveness, and immense speed, which will result, even though they will do so within the laws of armed conflict, will result in very, very large numbers of civilian casualties in southern Lebanon in particular. Uh, and, of course, that is the objective of Hezbollah, is to incur their own civilian casualties from their own side. It's to provoke Israel to kill civilians in the same way as Hamas has done in Gaza very effectively in order to isolate Israel and to demonize Israel and to cause the vilification of Israel. And they know that the West, in many cases, including the United States, including the United Kingdom and other European countries, they know that the automatic reaction to defensive measures by Israel against its enemies is to attack Israel. Not, not militarily attack them, but attack Israel and put Israel in front of the United Nations accused of war crimes and crimes against humanity. And that is what, what causes Hezbollah, Hamas, and these other organizations to carry out aggressive action against Israel. And we play into their hands with our reaction. And that's what we're recommending is that the West makes it absolutely clear at this stage that if aggression occurs from Hezbollah in Lebanon against uh, Israel, then that will be condemned by the West and Israel be, will be supported by the West. Uh, and what that requires is a great deal of strong leadership from Western leaders in the face of some pretty horrific television imagery which is going to result from this. Uh, and I think that, that uh, is, is the principal message that I would like to deliver. Now I'll hand over to General Lord Dannett who will speak further on it. Well, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. It's a great pleasure to, 
to be here and to uh, address this group this afternoon. I, I don't want to um, try and outdo Colonel Kemp in terms of British military history, but as I sometimes say to American audiences, my regiment was 100 years old before your country was invented. Um, but in the War of Independence, um, the American revolutionaries overran my regimental baggage train and, amongst other things, stole the regimental silver. So whenever I go to dinner with wealthy people in the United States, I look around to see what's on the table to see whether any of my silver could be um, recovered. But so far, my search has been in vain. But um, on to more serious subjects. Um, I'm very grateful for this opportunity to join with the team to focus on the growing threat to the security of Israel from Hezbollah and to dwell on the consequences of Israel's necessary counter-offensive should another Lebanon war develop. What I'd like to do uh, in the few minutes that I've got to speak is to look at Hezbollah today, its strategic concept and capabilities, the new developments within that, and then the danger arising from those developments. So first of all, some facts about Hezbollah's capacity for warfare today. By any analysis, uh, I think we all know Hezbollah is Iran's Arab proxy and the crown jewel in Iran's strategy of warfare by terrorist proxy. And today is a vastly more potent organization than at the time of the last Lebanon war. Now, while Hezbollah is described as a terrorist organization on account of its ethos and tactics, for the purpose of combat capabilities on the ground, Hezbollah is neither a terrorist or a guerrilla organization, <clears throat> but essentially now more of a standard military force with a clear chain of command and the infrastructure to protect and maintain its high command. Um, Hezbollah oversees a force of around 25,000 fighters, with around 5,000 of them having completed advanced training in Iran. In addition, at least 20,000 people are organized in reserve units, and these numbers are vastly larger than they were in 2006. Hezbollah's main firepower is based on a huge arsenal of over 100,000 rockets and missiles. Yes, the majority of these are short-range rockets, but thousands of them now have a much larger range, up to 250 kilometers and possibly more. Thus, not only has the sheer numeric scale of the threat increased exponentially, but the lethality is greatly increased on account of larger payloads, range, and higher targeting accuracy. Hezbollah's ground forces are equipped, as you'd expect, with AK-47 assault rifles, night vision goggles, and advanced anti-tank weapons. Its combatants are highly skilled in deploying explosives and anti-tank guided missiles, which they have in the past used to great effect, including against infantry. And the combat experience acquired in, Iraq, in, Sy in Syria and the vast increase in numbers also today give Hezbollah an ability to maneuver and carry out relatively large-scale ground attacks at the scale of company <coughs> or battalion level, including the integration of a new armoured support unit consisting of modern tanks and APCs, and probably experimenting now with the integration of close air support. Further, Hezbollah also now possesses hundreds of UAVs with surveillance and in some cases munitions deliverable capabilities, as well as advanced air defence systems and significant capabilities for naval warfare based on coast-to-sea cruise missiles. Its intelligence capabilities have also been developed significantly. So all in all, this means that the military threat that Hezbollah poses is potent and it's deadly. It's been honed by extensive battlefield experience in Syria and supported by the infrastructure for warfare of its state sponsor, Iran. So, so much for Hezbollah's capabilities, but what of its basic strategic concept? Now, this now consists of a tripartite interplay between terrorism, traditional military capabilities, and political activity. Governed, in an underlying sense, by its religious ideology in justifying its engagement in military action in the name of Allah, its warfare is unrestricted by rules, laws, or morality, and as such it fights amongst the civilian people and under their cover. And with this perceived protection, it targets its adversaries, civilians, with impunity, often as an explicitly calculated method of gaining strategic advantage. Hezbollah has transformed almost every Shiite village in the country's south into a military asset. This is an elaborate, multi-year effort requiring significant investment. Israeli officials estimate that approximately 10% of the population in each village 
are now Hezbollah combatants, while the majority of houses play host to various forms of military equipment. Below these villages and urban areas, Hezbollah has constructed an extensive array of tunnel systems for the purpose of conducting warfare. At the same time, Hezbollah deliberately targets Israeli civilians as an explicit tactical imperative. It's their intention to do that. It will seek to inflict maximum damage on Israel's civilian population when deploying its vast arsenal of rockets and missiles in the hope of weakening Israel's resolve and will target specific civilian and critical national infrastructure to gain tactical advantage. A central development in Hezbollah's strategic concept today is to take the battle onto Israeli soil in case of a conflict. And the goal of such operations would be to occupy a vital area in Israel and hold it for as long as possible with the aim of demonstrating Hezbollah's anti-Israeli credentials to the wider Arab world and using kidnapped soldiers and civilians as leverage in diplomatic negotiations. Further, in the event of hostilities, it's highly feasible that Hezbollah will be joined by at least parts of other terrorist organizations within Iran's realm of influence, inviting foreign Shia forces to fight in Lebanon, as well as the area it now controls inside Syria, close to the border with Israel. So taken together, Hezbollah today thus presents a seriously capable force akin to an army, yet with no compunction about breaking all laws of war by fighting from among its own civilians and potentially making Israel's civilians its target too. It's developed significantly since the last war and poses a grave danger, not just to the people of Israel, but to the Lebanese civilian population, which would be in serious danger from its tactics in the event of a new war and the inevitable Israeli counter-offensive. So with those comments about Hezbollah's capabilities and strategic concepts, uh, I'll now turn over to General Klaus Nauman, uh, who will take the uh, conversation a little bit further. Klaus. Well, thank you very much. And it's my pleasure to be here in Washington once again. As you know, I'm not coming from a country which ever tried to burn down the White House. <laughs> but, uh, but we made a small contribution to win the War of Independence by things such as General von Steuben. Based on the military capabilities outlined by General Dunnett, and given Hezbollah's strategic concept of going after Israel's civilians while hiding among those of Lebanon, it is clear that the new Lebanon war would be significantly worse in consequence than the previous conflict. There is a real danger of such a war breaking out, and grave humanitarian and geostrategic interests are at stake for all of our countries if it were to happen. As such, we must consider several inherent problems in the situation that compound the problem and urgent actions our nation can take to tackle it. First, the concept we in the West, the United States, and even more so Europe apply to the Lebanese state is outdated. It is simply no longer the case that there is a Western-friendly Lebanese state with a foreign element in the form of Hezbollah. The organization has been entirely successful in establishing its domination over Lebanon. It installs a government that can run only with its explicit or tacit approval, since Hezbollah has demonstrated it can bring to bear the most force in the country. It controls the presidency, infiltrates and collaborates with the Lebanese armed forces, and fails to serve the interests of the people of Lebanon as it pursues Iran's agenda against Israel and in Syria. These new realities need to be better reflected in transatlantic attitudes to Lebanon. Given the evident rearmament of Hezbollah, and particularly its embedding of its military apparatus among Lebanon's civilians, fighters, weapons, command and control are all spread through South Lebanon villages, it is clear that neither the relevant United Nations resolution or in particular, the UNIFIL mission are having the required effect. 
we saw evidence of UNIFIL being hampered in their work by Hezbollah, as it is in the report, and bitter complaints, indeed a diplomatic incident with your UN ambassador over UNIFIL's refusal to accept. One must assume for political reason what is an obvious fact on the count. Hezbollah is rearming in plain sight of UNIFIL and setting the scene for serious war crimes in case of a conflict. Such a conflict is likely not be only because of Iran's and Hezbollah's implacable program against Israel, but not least because of Hezbollah suffers a legitimacy as regards its claim to be a Lebanese organization defending Lebanon in the wake of its actions in Syria. Attacking Israel is thus an imperative for this reason also. Given what we have heard and also what our delegation heard in Israel, it is clear that the new realities in the region and the imperatives on Israel in such a conflict mean war would be a very serious outcome indeed. So we urge Western nations in the strongest possible terms to take immediate firm action to prevent such an outcome. The American administration has made a start in identifying correctly the Iranian root of this problem and in expanding its policy vis-a-vis -vis Iran to include its auxiliary activities and of course specifically Hezbollah. But we need to see consequent pressure on Hezbollah and on the Lebanese government, politically, financially, and in terms of military deterrence, not least by making clear that Israel will have every right to defend itself vigorously from an attack by the Iran Hezbollah axis now present on its borders in Lebanon and in Syria. But Europe in particular must do more to recognize these realities and stand against them. The political cost of Hezbollah's integration into the fabric of the Lebanese state must be raised. Europe should at long last unequivocally prescribe the organization as a whole and stop giving pretense to the false distinction between its military and political character. They are indivisible. International diplomacy, and the UNIFIL mission in particular, must also reflect the character of the threat Hezbollah now poses and recognize that it has been allowed to grow and to grow despite ostensible measures to curtail it. This cannot go on because of war the contours of which are already discernible, would be a calamity for the people of Lebanon foremost, but also for Europe and the West, given the intense struggle with the fallout from an already fatally unstable region, in particular in terms of humanitarian crisis and refugee flows that Europe is struggling to accommodate. And that is, as you all know, causing political upheaval in some of our own countries. So we welcome the administration's renewed focus on Iran and Hezbollah and all actions designed to curtail their behavior and raise its cost. But we urge that in our view, the situation is so serious that we must see more and more robust action on behalf of Western nations against this threat and before it is too late. The people of Lebanon, the people of Israel, and the region require us to address the threat Hezbollah poses with the full force of your and our considerable means to pressure them to curtail their offensive actions against Israel and against all of our interests. Thank you very much. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you very much. I, I will take the moderator's prerogative while someone pulls this uh, podium back a little bit so I can see everybody on that side of the room to ask the first question. Uh, and then we'll open it up uh, to Q&A. Thank you very much. 
so, gentlemen, you, you collectively uh, portrayed just how horrible another war uh, would be uh, and just how important it is to do something about it now. I'm sure we're going to get some questions from people about some more to drill down a little bit more about what can be done, and, and in case you all don't, then, then I certainly will. But the question I'd like to ask you now is this. What do you see in the immediate as the most likely scenario or scenarios that could lead to uh, a third uh, war, even uh, assuming that neither Israel uh, nor Hezbollah wants one? And I'm thinking in particular about things like the fact that the Israeli Air Force has been quite regularly, according to their former uh, Air Force chief of staff, carrying out strikes against uh, weapons shipments to Hezbollah of the type that you described, uh, further uh, building up their current arsenals. Uh, I'm thinking about um, Israeli concerns in particular about the potential de uh, deployment of still more sophisticated uh, Russian air defense systems that, if deployed, might curtail Israel's uh, freedom of operation and perhaps make Israel feel that it needs to do something more now before such systems are deployed. And from the flip side, I'm, I'm thinking about uh, um, the fact that Hezbollah is building up uh, its arsenal and, and uh, according to the Israelis, building a facility that could be used uh, for domestic production of missiles, um, all of which are things that could lead one or the other to feel uh, that despite their interests, that there is something they need to do, even if it's small, that could get out of hand. How do you see in the near term the threat of war breaking out, notwithstanding the fact that neither party wants one in the immediate? Um, well, I think if I could um, perhaps um, speak first. What you describe, all those potential scenarios are all, all quite likely. Uh, and although the theme of the, our report and the theme of this conference is how to prevent a third Lebanon war, you could actually make the case to say that a third Lebanon war has already begun. It's just in a very low-profile stage at the present moment. And <clears throat> the reason it could go from that low-profile, cool stage to a hot war um, overnight is probably as a result of miscalculation or one of those things that you alluded to actually happening. <clears throat> it is not unreasonable, you can argue, that uh, the Israeli Air Force should be striking to or aiming to interdict the further growth of Hezbollah's missile manufacturing capability or its uh, importation of uh, further missiles from elsewhere. <clears throat> so if you accept that there are from time to time Israeli air, uh, airplanes operating in what you might call Lebanese airspace, then the risk of an aircraft being shot down and the consequences of that are quite possible. It's also quite possible that um, you can get indisciplined elements of Hezbollah making a low-level attack, um, <clears throat> almost by accident, um, on the ground. And it's, or indeed, we've seen incidents in the past of uh, Israeli soldiers straying over the border, someone becomes, uh, becomes um, a hostage. And all those situations are, are possible. And it wouldn't take an awful lot of that tinderbox to take the situation from one that's under control to a situation that gets out of hand. <clears throat> and we've, we've referred about earlier to the ineffectiveness of, of UNIFIL. And I think there is an argument here to say that if the international community really became aware of the potential for this war, which no one wants to see go hot, that uh, a, uh, an international force, a UN force, with a stronger mandate and stronger military capabilities to police that southern Lebanon-Israeli border would go a long way to preventing war by accident or the war that's already in existence actually coming into being. General mm -hmm. Naman? Yeah, if I may add one or two thoughts uh, on this. Uh, first, I assume that uh, Nasrallah's chain of command is very tight and that he is able to keep Hezbollah uh, under strict control. At the moment, it seems to me he is not interested in launching a war right now since he still has to justify the losses which Hezbollah suffered during the operation in uh, Syria. And this is not easy to explain to the Lebanese people why this happened. Then secondly, I think he will wait until he sees a clear chance of winning by surprise. At the moment, this doesn't 
appear to be the case. The risk is there. But he is not entirely sure. And as long as this is not the case, he will probably not start. But this could change quickly and overnight. So we are still in the situation of taking action right now. And I'm saying this based on the experience of the Cold War. We were confronted with a superiority in, in Europe, which if I remember my days as a brigade commander where I had a sector to defend against the Czech army in a inferior by one to eight. Nevertheless, I was convinced that we would win. Uh, knowing the Czech army after the war, I'm convinced that I was right. But, <laughs> but nevertheless, um, we were in a situation of inferiority and we never su nevertheless succeeded in producing uncertainty in our opponent's mind. And this uncertainty helped us to preserve the peace. So we are back to the deterrence business and we need to deter Hezbollah from taking action. The one factor which remains, which I at the same time see as pretty <coughs> unlikely is that a war might happen by accident. The, if you have 100,000 missiles, um, oh, and, and, the, and the chain of command is not absolutely watertight, it could happen that something happens. And should the casualties on the side of Israel be too big to be absorbed, then we are in the catastrophe. And for all these reasons, I think it is important that we try to influence the government of Lebanon, the government in Iran, to t take Hezbollah really very, very tightly on the leash, so that the dog cannot escape. I think one, if I could add one thing, we, we shouldn't forget the reason, the fundamental reason why all these rockets are positioned there, and it is in order to respond to either an attack on Iran <coughs> or to preempt an attack on Iran that the Iranians expect to happen. That's the primary reason why they're there. Um, <clears throat> and why, could, why would it be likely that either U the US or Israel would attack Iran? I think in the current situation, mainly because of uh, the, the Iranian nuclear program. And President Obama's JCPOA, which effectively paved the way for an Iranian nuclear weapon, has made the possibility of, a, of it being necessary for either Israel or the United States to carry out a military attack against Iran when it gets those weapons, which it will unless the JCPOA is properly addressed. Um, that, that is the most, likely re the most likely scenario, in my opinion, in which those missiles would be used other than, as the two generals have both, men both mentioned, in an accidental scenario. And you also mentioned, Matthew, at the beginning, the I Israel's um, continuous, not continuous, but occasional attack against uh, Iranian movement of advanced weapons through Syria, either to Syria or intending to go to Lebanon, um, and Israel's action to prevent that. Uh, I think, again, that's an area that we should be focusing on very closely, and perhaps people might want to speak about that a bit later on. But that is something that, that we in the West, that the United States government and European governments, should be not, not condemning, as they sometimes do condemn that Israel, actions by Israel on that, but actually supporting Israel's actions to prevent the further build-up of rockets in Lebanon. I think if I could also just say, I think one thing we haven't got on the table, perhaps sufficiently at the present moment, is further to all that we've been saying, is that if this war did become a hot war, as we hope it won't, but the potential is very much there for whatever reasons, and we've just discussed those, um, in our conversations at the highest levels during this military working group, it became quite pretty clear that um, Israel's counteroffensive would be immediate and phenomenal. Um, they would have to do that, and uh, targets right the length and breadth of Lebanon would, would be considered legitimate targets, and I think everybody must be aware of that, and in a sense it's important that that information, that understanding is got out uh, ahead of what might possibly happen, because people have got to understand that Israel would really have no choice but to have a counteroffensive in that manner. Yeah. The deterrent threat is only there if people know about it. Let's open to questions and answers. Let's start with the ambassador in the back. If you could wait for a microphone coming to you, it should be right behind you, and we'll, we'll get to everybody. 
Hi, uh, Mark Ginsburg. Um, all of you seem to have danced around this issue, and I would like to pin it down. Given the magnitude of the offensive capability, particularly the missile capability of Hezbollah, is the Israeli government acting as if this, or, or would you recommend, to draw a historical analogy, that the Israeli government is being negligent and acting as if this is 1973? Or should this be an Israeli government that should be acting as if it were 1967? Failing to launch a preemptive strike uh, or preemptive attack knowing the casualties that Israel would incur from Hezbollah's capability seems to be almost an act of negligence at this point. I'm wondering if you'd comment on that. I, I, I don't think it's right to say that um, the Israeli government would be negligent by not preempting. I think, I think the international community would fail to understand preemption. What the Israeli government is trying to say is that if we are provoked, and we might be provoked in a relatively minor way, but we don't know how this is going to develop. We will then have to react in a very significant way. Hence my previous comment just a moment or two ago about the counteroffensive. And it was also quite clear to us during our, our working group visit that not only is the capability of Israel uh, very profound, particularly its air force, in terms of, of the counteroffensive, but I think also to try and minimize the effect on the Israeli population, the amount of effort that's gone into homeland security to be able to absorb uh, a degree of the, the first strike, if you like, but Israel's not going to allow a first strike to really develop. As soon as something significant has developed, the counteroffensive will be launched. So it's not quite the same as preemption. I don't think preemption will be understood in the international context, but I think a significant counteroffensive very quickly would be. And that's really one of the reasons why this report has been written, to get people to understand that. And again, it's all part of de 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 deterrence as well. Let me, let me underline this point of General Lord Dunant. Mm. Uh, preemptive action is tied to very strict internationally acknowledged legal restrictions. Though the, the attack has to be imminent, and what this means in our days is an issue which will keep lawyers busy for the next two generations to come. But uh, to, to prove clearly that an attack was imminent I think is a mission impossible. So Israel would risk to lose the support of the international community if it did something which would l look like a first strike action. That's a high risk. And in our intertwined world, a countries such as Israel, legitimate as its security concerns are, cannot run the risk to lose the hearts and minds of the people of other countries in the world. And that is a big dilemma they are confronted with. I think another calculation that Israel's making in this is, is what the effect, what the beneficial effect would be of a preemptive strike versus responding to an attack by um, Iranian, uh, by Hezbollah missiles. Uh, and I, 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 my guess is that they, there might be some small advantage, but it wouldn't be a massive advantage because there would still be a response, and it would be a significant response on his blow, which would take some time for the Israeli Air Force and other Israeli elements to effectively suppress. Okay, I see many of you raising hands. I see you all. We're going to get to everybody. Can we go to Pat from Europe Hall in the back? Just raise your hand so they can bring you a mic. There you go. Thank you very much. Sure. Pat Byrne, I'm the Europol Senior Representative in the United States. Just a, a brief comment on the White House, uh, built by an Irish architect in <laughs> 1792, so we built it up before you burned it down. Um, uh, I know this is very much, and thank you very much for an excellent, your, your thoughts so far, and you're focusing on the military campaign and what might happen with Israel. We in Europol are seeing an increase in Hezbollah activity uh, right across a range of areas, including uh, in many civilian populations in South America and in Europe. We've seen attacks in Europe. Um, you also refer in your report about diversionary tactics in, in terms of attacks. I think there's one you referred to in 2006 when they were, their, their core attack was a military target, but they were they attacked civilians with rockets as diversion. Did you in your study or did you, did you contemplate or have you thought about 
the increase in activity, for instance, down in South America, where you could have an attack on the US homeland, or increased attacks like we had in Burgos in Bulgaria. And I'd be very interested to know what you might see as the threat level in terms of build-up or a diversionary attack to a military conflict. Yes, I, th yes, I think we did. Uh, we considered these events. We were fully aware of these events, and, but we all were united in the conviction that fighting terrorism all across the world is a common task which all our nations are confronted with and have to take on. And for that, there is no need to win international uh, justification or support. All of our nations are agreed on the necessity to fight terrorism. Uh, but in this particular case of Israel, we have seen again and again in the past that Israel was attacked because it took defensive actions. And uh, we wanted to make the public aware that in case of a new Lebanon war, the quick and, and determined reaction of Israel would cause a lot of casualties which would give new, uh, would add new nourishment to this uh, attitude of blaming Israel for taking action. I think the, the, um, the, the presence of Hezbollah sleeper cells and more active cells around Europe and around the world, and including here in the United States, is, is recognized and represents a real threat. Um, and has done for a long time. And we're not just talking, as, as you, I'm sure you know, we're not just talking about raising funds and gaining support for Hezbollah. We're talking about planning and maybe carrying out, as they have done, uh, specific terrorist attacks. And, and I think one area that's already been touched upon is the need for Western governments, in Europe in particular, to recognize the entirety of Hezbollah as a terrorist organization, not just the external action element of um, of Hezbollah, but the, the fact that it's a unified organization with a leader that needs to be completely ostracized and, and uh, cut off from any funding and cut off from all contact with, with any responsible government until it changes its ways, which is unlikely to happen. So I think that, that, that is something that uh, I certainly have tried in the past to, to convince the UK government to do that. The problem is that in the case of the UK government, and I suspect other European governments as well, they see a need to have a dialogue with elements of Hezbollah, which I believe is misguided. And going on to the overall terrorist threat, of course, um, there is a tendency in European countries, I hope not so much in the United States, but certainly in European countries, to look at terrorism directed against Israel in a different way to terrorism directed against our own countries. There's almost, in, in some elements of the media and in some elements of government and political leaders and international organizations, there is a, a view that actually Israel deserves what's coming to it, and we don't, so it has to be handled and treated differently, which, of course, is totally wrong, misguided, and immoral. Okay, let's take some more questions starting right over here, please. Uh, thank you, I'm Leon Weintraub. Uh, U.S. Foreign Service retired. Initially, I'd like to thank uh, uh, Colonel Kemp for all his writings about the conduct of, I of the IDF in warfare. I appreciate your comments. I'd like to ask the panel to speak a little bit about the military force of the government of Lebanon as it relates to Hezbollah. Are they competitors? Does one have a veto power over the other? Is one subordinate to the other? I know in recent years, the U.S. government has tried to Help the uh, uh, help the military of the government of Lebanon is is that a fool's errand? Uh, what are we doing in strengthening them? So speak about the relationship between Hezbollah and the government uh, and the military of Lebanon. I think we've got to look at uh, two ends of this, at least to start with. Um, you're right, and it's a theme that's come up in our conversations variously today that the U.S. government has currently got a policy of trying to engage with the Lebanese armed forces, um, and and that is perfectly reasonable and perfectly sensible. Um, and I think there's no reason why that, that shouldn't continue. But as I tried to bring out in, in my introductory remarks uh, earlier, it's quite clear that the way that Hezbollah has developed, it now has got the characteristics much more of being an army in its own right. It's got command and control, it's got infrastructure. It's begun to operate and maneuver in a way that a regular army w would understand. 
And recognising that, it has, it has succeeded in embedding itself into not just South Lebanon geographically, but into the civil and military structures in South Lebanon and Lebanon more widely. So you've kind of got two different things going on here. You've got a government like the United States government trying to have a relationship with the Lebanese armed forces, whereas on the ground you've got Hezbollah acting more like an army, almost in partnership and in parallel, and within the same overall structure as the Lebanese armed forces. So we're in that sort of ambiguous situation of trying to engage with a set of legitimate armed forces, which are increasingly becoming wrapped up in illegitimate armed forces, and that's a challenge. Can we come right over here, please? <clears throat> Raise your hand so we can see where to, there you, thank you. Thank you, I actually had, uh, my name is Lara with Safadi Foundation. I actually had a very similar question. Since 2005, the US has given the Lebanese Armed Forces over $1 billion in military assistance. So maybe if you could just comment a little bit more about how you see the effectiveness of that assistance and if you have, if the report has any recommendations about that. Also, what can the Lebanese government do that it is not doing now in terms of dealing with Hezbollah? Thank you. Well, well um, th thank you, and I, was, I won't repeat my, 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 my previous answer. Um, <clears throat> I think it's absolutely the right thing to do for the U.S. government to try and engage with, with the Lebanese uh, armed forces. But I think I'd probably also widen the answer out to an earlier comment that we made about uh, the international community more widely engaging in Lebanon in the context of the United Nations and, and UNIFIL. At UNIFIL, we saw during our, our, our studies, is a hugely compromised force. And it would be as useful, if not more useful, for the US, the UK, other European governments to put their weight behind a new UN initiative to strengthen the mandate of the international security force uh, in, in Lebanon and to increase the size and capability of that. Yes, in conjunction with the Lebanese armed forces, that would certainly make sense and as a way of mitigating and reducing the illegitimate, if you like, uh, irregular type activities of Hezbollah, which we've already stressed are becoming more regular because they're not being controlled. So there is uh, a developing relationship between the Lebanese army and Hezbollah, but it's, but it's an illegitimate relationship. And I think if it was more externally policed by a strength and international mandate, that would probably help. I think it also comes back to the point I made earlier, which is that we should isolate the entirety of Hezbollah, not just the uh, the so-called terrorist elements of it, but the entirety of it. And then we should be encouraging the Lebanese government and armed forces to get rid of it. Now, I know it's easier say, saying that than doing it. And that encouragement could well include punitive action by the international community against Lebanon unless it acts against it. Because of what, what it's doing, whether it can actually stop it or not, what it is doing is allowing um, the world's greatest state sponsor of terrorism to control their country and, and by, by simply go along with it and assisting the armed forces and the government of Lebanon, we are in a, fa in a way we're colluding with that. Right here in the blue blazer, just kind of raise your hand for them. Yep. Thank you. Yes, hi. Uh, I'm Joe Macaron from the Arab Center. I was just struck by the what jo what General Norman said about there's no more friendly state, uh, fr friendly Western state in, in, in Lebanon, which has a very dangerous policy implications uh, regarding what's happening in the Lebanese economy is tied to the U.S. Uh, you have the central bank uh, cooperating, you have the Lebanese army, you have counterterrorism, so thinking that we have to uh, not have political annoyances in Lebanon that's beyond the military, uh, military uh, implication. Uh, it's a little bit uh, um, dangerous in the police uh, implication. The second, my, my main question is, uh, I didn't read the report yet, but I didn't understand what are the robust action. We, I mean, the international community tried everything, full-fledged war, sanctions, so how we can achieve this objective without preemptive war, without collectively punishing Lebanon, and without trying to understand the regional uh, context. So what are one, two, three of the actions? Well, I see three possible actions which we could take, uh, which promise some success. I start with uh, the country which, in my view, uh, 
is really in control of the entire uh, development, and that's Iran. Uh, Hezbollah is the prolonged arm of Iran in, uh, in, it, in its attempt to achieve a, c a better control of uh, this part of the Middle East. We have to convince the government of Iran if it wants to return into uh, the international community as a respected partner, that it has to, at least I put it as cautiously as I can, it has to reconsider its role in sponsoring international terrorism. Um, if it's not willing to do it, then we have economic tools which could hurt Iran, and we should not shy away from using them. Um, second point is, as General Donald and Colonel Kemp had mentioned, we have to, th to think how we can influence the government of Lebanon. Uh, we have so far, as I have said, as my colleagues have said, based our considerations on the, on the assumption that there is a military activity done by Hezbollah and there's a political activity on the side of the government of Lebanon which plays a different role and which portrays to us that the government of Lebanon is uh, more or less a uh, controlled state. We came to the conclusion, and many other observers are supporting this, that in reality, Hezbollah and the Lebanon government began to form an entity. And the, state, the president of uh, Lebanon has stated that Hezbollah is part of his instruments in the, in the common struggle against Israel. So if that is the case, then we have to tell the Lebanese government that we might apply pressure on the government of Lebanon to stop this and to, to put Hezbollah on the leash to the extent possible and to the extent which we can control. We, there we have instruments, again economic instruments, but they may, they may work. And the third element is, as uh, General Donald has said in particular, uh, strengthen UNIFIL. We have, um, we, we have to reconsider the mandate of UNIFIL. Um, I was part of an international uh, working group of the United Nations which looked into peacekeeping operations. We produced this Brahimi report, which you may have seen. And we came to the conclusion that only, I should say, robust mandates are suited to cope with such a situation. The ma mandate of UNIFIL is not a robust ma mandate, but this requires two players to concur with it. One is the state of Lebanon, since no UN mandate can be imposed on a, on a country. And secondly, the executing nations have to take the risk which are associated with a robust mandate. So if we try to pursue these three steps simultaneously and in a coordinated way, we might have a chance. We should Just also forget that Iran not only threatens Israel, but also threatens much of the Arab world. And, and Iran's military capability is not simply focused on Israel. They're also focused on countries like Saudi Arabia. Um, and we, we, I and others in this room were in Riyadh recently. We were in Riyadh when President Obama made, uh, President Obama, President Trump made uh, his speech. And there was, there was enormous delight in Riyadh um, among policymakers there uh, about the, the, the fact that actually at last the Iranian aggression is hopefully going to be addressed. Um, and, you know, you just have to look at what's going on in Yemen and the, 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 the proxies being used by Iran in Yemen to attack Yemen and indirectly also and sometimes directly to attack Saudi Arabia. So it's not just a problem that needs to be dealt with in relation to Israel, but also 
the, uh, the entire Gulf region and the world. Can we have a mic over here, please? Uh, Bob Winter, a retired international lawyer. Um, thank you very much for your important work. Um, a number of you have commented, particularly um, Colonel Kemp, on Iran and the JCPOA and the significance of that. Putting aside the merits of that uh, agreement, which is still highly debated, what you're calling for, I think, requires a lot of political action and political changes of views by a number of governments, particularly governments uh, within the EU, as I believe a number of you have recognized. From that point of view, do you think it is tactically useful to make the merits of the JCPO, POA, a issue at this time, which uh, a number of commentators have suggested would be very, very divisive within Europe, as opposed to making the issue Iranian behavior as a sponsor of international terrorism apart from the JCPOA. Given that the JCPOA was agreed and is in effect for a number of years, given the urgency of the situation, how do you view that tactical choice? Thank you. As you introduced yourself as an international lawyer, uh, you will agree with me that doing away the nuclear agreement does not necessarily mean that everything has to be done away. Um, I, I could imagine that uh, some quarters in Europe uh, would wish to see as much of this nuclear deal to be preserved as possible. And there are good reasons for that, since doing it entirely away is, means at the same time uh, to give Iran a free hand to accelerate its nuclear uh, ambitions. The legal question is whether one side can do away the agreement or not. After all, it's still part of a United Nations Security Council resolution. And you as a lawyer may know better than I whether one can simply uh, say a UN uh, Security Council resolution is no longer valid, one-sided. Presumably you need a Security Council resolution to arrive at this point. I don't know. It is a complicated issue. Two is also that this uh, desire on the side of the president, which still is not yet the desire of the United States Congress as far as I know, um, is uh, is divisive in Europe and acts divisively. But we need, if we want to contain Iran, we need unity between Europe and the United States. Uh, so we have to, to deal this entire thing very, very carefully. I readily admit uh, that the agreement, the nuclear agreement, uh, had two serious flaws. Uh, the one is that the missile program was not addressed, and the second is that the terrorism sponsorship was not addressed. I know that it was that they tried, but they couldn't get Iranian agreement. And so the negotiator's uh, objective was to at least stop and control the ongoing nuclear activities. And I think we also need to understand, had, had the stop not been achieved, Iran might well be at this point in time a nuclear power. Uh, nobody knows exactly, but they are not too far away. And uh, the other thing, if, if I look at the nuclear capability, it always consists of three things. The one is the development of a warhead, that is addressed in the agreement. The second thing is to mate a warhead to a missile. And the third is the command and control capability to bring this missile into the right place. If I see the Iranian missile program, I'm, 
I, once upon a time, I was an artillery officer, long, long ago. I, I know that um, you do not develop missiles with a range of three to 4,000 kilometers to transport a couple of tons of uh, conventional demolition stuff. If you do that, that's nonsense. It's, it's a waste of money, and no reasonable man would do this. So such a missile is designed to carry weapons of mass destruction, be it nuclear, be it chemical, be it biological. So Iran is pursuing, through its missile program, a mass destruction weapons program. And that also has to be stopped. So uh, I think we, we are in a, in a extremely difficult uh, situation. We, we need to find a way to keep as much as possible from the nuclear agreement and to win Iran to agree on modifications. Um, to, to simply abandon it, I think is, from my perspective, the, the best way to achieve a nuclear armed Iran. And with that, ladies and gentlemen, a nuclear armed uh, Middle East. Since the consequence is without any doubt, the moment in which Iran has a nuclear weapon, Saudi Arabia will have one, Egypt will go after one, and Turkey will look at nuclear options as well. And if you have such a bunch of people being nuclear armed, the threshold of waging nuclear wars is very, very low. Since then, the, the old idea of use it or lose it will come back to the fore. And here as a European, I have to say, for me, a nightmare. We are too close to it. Well, on that high note, let's bring a mic right over here, please. And then we're going to come around. Yeah, from the Israel Jerusalem report, I have two questions. One is, what uh, what are the uh, implications from the military point of view of, Leb of uh, Hezbollah's involvement in Syria? How has that affected their military capabilities? The other question is, uh, the role of Iran. I'm a little bit puzzled. On the one hand, uh, Iran, uh, one, the West has to make Iran understand what they can do, what they cannot do. On the other hand, in, in uh, Syria, uh, the United States and, and Russia apparently have made a deal that favors Iran and uh, Iranian capabilities and deployment heavily, and probably also Hezbollah. So on the one hand, how do you take a stand against Iran? On the other hand, um, you gave them more or less uh, 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 free play in, in, in Syria to, to strengthen their capabilities with American consent. How do you address that? Well, I think uh, I, I won't repeat what um, General Klaus has just said, but I'd certainly build on the argument that General Klaus has just uh, developed as far as the nuclear issue is concerned. Uh, coming specifically to the first part of your question, uh, Syria, Hezbollah got itself in, involved in Syria or chose to get itself involved in, in Syria. And I think as we already said around the table, um, there is a degree of explanation to Hezbollah fighters, Hezbollah people, largely drawn from the, the Lebanese population, as to why that was the case, why that was important to justify the casualties that they undoubtedly took there. Um, uh, then you come back, I think, to the, the wider point that you're making in terms of, of, of Iran. Um, I mean, there is no doubt that the so-called um, uh, Shia crescent from Iran through parts of, of, of Iraq and Syria in, into Lebanon is very much an objective, uh, a wider strategic objective that they would like to see, and they see that uh, in their interest. It's not in, I don't think it's in the West's interest, it's certainly not in is Israel's interest. So I think we have to find other mechanisms whereby pressure can be applied on Iran. Um, 
we've talked about the nuclear bit. Uh, I don't need to say uh, any more on that. General Klaas has also talked about um, economic pressures as well. I think that's also I- extremely uh, important. So um, none of these things are simple. They are all complex. Whether Hezbollah possibly to an extent regrets the degree of its involvement in Syria, I don't know. It's probably fairly opportunistic. But uh, in that sort of mess uh, that has become the Syrian civil war, it was probably an inevitable consequence that they would get involved to an extent. I, don't know whether you... I, I, I would like to support um, General Nauman's comments about the, um, the horrors that are going to surround a nuclear-armed Iran. Um, I, I, I think I have a slight disagreement in as much as um, the, 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 the current agreement does not stop Iran from becoming nuclear-armed. What it does is to, is to delay. It, it actually allows it to get nuclear weapons in a very, very short time, and in a time, obviously, that is beyond President Obama's government's term of office when he, when he made the deal. But nevertheless, it does allow that to happen. And therefore, it's got to be changed, as the general suggested. It's got to be changed so, that it, so we don't end up with a, a nuclear-armed Iran. And I think that, in terms of the previous question, that has got to be the number one priority. But in parallel to that, rather than necessarily either or, I think in parallel to that, Iran's um, imperial aggression throughout the Middle East does need to be curtailed uh, as, as strongly as it possibly can be and resisted as strongly as it possibly can be. But it seems that the American policy in Syria is strengthening the very Yeah. Uh, I think General <clears throat> Nauman made it clear that's complicated. <laughs> David Pollack. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I, uh, th- in a way, this is uh, perhaps a follow up um, to part of uh, previous questions. And I, I want to focus on Russia. Do, do you see any role for Russia to be a positive partner in restraining, deterring, limiting, whatever you want to call it, uh, Hezbollah, either in Iran, in Syria, or against Israel directly from Lebanon, or and in deterring or preventing this next war? Um, if I have first go on that, I think Russia is an interesting complication to this whole issue. But I think its uh, involvement comes into two categories, if you like. I think Russia, the traditional ally and supplier of weaponry and know-how, military know-how to Syria, saw an opportunity to get involved in the Syrian civil war to its own benefit. Um, And I think you have to see that in the wider context of Putin's personal motivation. Um, One often says, scrape him to the core. What you find is an unreformed KGB colonel in there who saw his beloved Warsaw Pact and Lieutenant Soviet Union destroyed by the... Lieutenant Colonel, he was never promoted. <laughs> Lieft- <laughs> <laughs> Lieutenant Colonel, <laughs> General Klaus. Of, we, we call them Colonel General, it doesn't matter. But scraping to the core, you've got a, an unreformed, uh, unregenerate KGB officer uh, there who saw his beloved Soviet Union and Warsaw Pact destroyed uh, at the end of the Cold War by the cohesion of the West and NATO. And he would love... Uh, which is why we see him chipping away in eastern Ukraine and the Baltics and elsewhere, and taking the opportunity of getting involved in the Syrian civil war to our discomfort as being part of his um, long-term ambition to see the credibility uh, of NATO uh, decaying. So that's one aspect of it. The other aspect of it is, as we all know, the, the growing size of the Muslim population in the wider Russian community of nations. Um, it, it, it won't be very long before more than 50% of the Russian population, I think we said earlier on today, by 2050, up to 20, 51% of Russian civilians could well be Muslim. So in a sense, Russia is playing with fire if it doesn't take seriously the um, Islamist agenda, which we see being played through in Hezbollah, we see being played through in the Shia Crescent um, and being orchestrated by Iran. So I think we've got to see Russia's involvement in two distinct aspects. And they've got to be as clever as they can to keep those two separated, I think. Yeah. Uh, I think we really have, as uh, Richard Dunner suggested, to differentiate between Putin's objective and Russia's long-term objectives. Putin's objective at the moment are to split the West and to weaken the West as far as he can. 
For that reason, he embarked on the adventure in Syria as he embarked on the adventure in eastern Ukraine and in Crimea. These three, three elements together are three millstones sto around his neck which may kill him economically. And see, he is about to make the same mistakes which ruined the former Soviet Union. Um, but that is his decision. Uh, the long-term interest of Russia, the strategic interest of Russia is not to allow a Muslim force to become too strong or to become a dominant power in the uh, Middle East region. And there we have a chance to, to try to talk to Russians again and to develop some common ideas on common strategies. If you'll allow me, let me tie in these, these last two questions a bit. I, I cut you off despite the good question because we can only take one at a time. But you have <coughs> Hezbollah effectively right now fighting together with Iran and Russia. Are you concerned? Did you find concern as you were doing your fieldwork for this um, that Hezbollah is learning particular capabilities, say, from working with the Russians? Uh, or concerns that uh, Russian air support, for example, may be facilitating still closer relationship between Hezbollah and Iran that could pose a threat for a near-term third Lebanon war? How does that, Hezbollah is not necessarily a co-equal in this triumvirate, but how does its uh, fighting together with Russia and Iran, which have some shared interest and maybe in some areas interests that don't completely align, how does, how does that affect the calculation going into your report? Well, I think there is some evidence, well, considerable evidence, um, much in the same way as I said just now, that um, Russia has been the, the long-term ally and supplier of military hardware and know-how to, to Syria, to say that that actually is extended also to uh, elsewhere in the region. So Ru Russian fingerprints are over quite a lot of, of this at the present time, and that's, that's reflected to, to, to an extent in the report. Um, but I think it does get back to the last discussion we've just had, and that Russia's got to be very careful in how it develops that because it's got two it's got two narratives, two contending narratives, which run the risk of actually colliding to its own disbenefit. I think also um, Hezbollah has gained a huge amount of experience as well as weaponry from its uh, operations in Syria. But it will be aware also that if it decides to fight against Israel, it's not fighting anything it's ever seen before. It's fighting a very different force, which it can never beat, and it will know it can never beat the IDF. I think every uh, every army that's ever come up against the IDF has has been roundly defeated, and they know that. And it goes back to the point I made at the very beginning, which is that the whole purpose of Hezbollah's potential operations against Israel are not to win a war, a hot war against Israel, but to bring international condemnation against Israel, to isolate Israel, to have Israel demonized in exactly the same way as Hamas attempted to do, and with, with a great deal of success in three Gaza conflicts and many other countries attempt to do. And, and we in the West play into that. We play into their hands. And we, by, by condemning Israel when Israel defends itself robustly, um, we, we validate the tactics used by people like Hezbollah and Hamas we encourage them to use more human shields, and I was very encouraged myself to to learn that today in Congress, we were speaking earlier on in, uh, in, in Congress, to learn today in Congress that one of the bills being introduced is against the use of human shields by Hezbollah. Um, but we, we in the West, you know, our governments, including the U.S. government in the past, hopefully not in the future, the British, the German, the other, other governments in Europe and the UN encourage the use of human shields. We, re, we have blood on our hands in that respect by not roundly condemning these people who provoke and attack Israel with the intention of forcing Israel to kill their own civilians uh, and, uh, and, and thus validating the tactics of these, uh, these people. Question right here, please, in the white shirt, and then we'll come here. Hi, I'm Brian. I work in Congress. Um, building off of what you just said about the role of, I guess, the public perception of the conflict, and I remember reading after the Second Lebanon War an article that said that like, the center of gravity has shifted from the battlefield now to the media and the newsroom. Um, we sort of have like a postmodern warfare. Um, 
do you think that that would still hold true if the next round was so great and so terrible? Um, I, th I think the, the, um, the immediate reaction, and this is what we, our report to an extent is all about, try and shape the opinions of uh, leaders in the West. But I think the immediate reaction, I mean, of course, Hezbollah is going to try and present it as Israeli aggression. And it's going to try and um, create some pretext for its own aggression. But it will try and persuade the world that it is Israeli aggression. Um, I doubt the Arab world will be taken in by that, but m many people in the West might will be taken in by that. And I think they will, con they will immediately try and condemn Israel in the sa exactly the same way as they've done it repeatedly. Not, not without exception. There are governments that actually see through it and have the courage to speak against this form of action. But, but I think there's two issues that we should bear in mind from the European perspective. One is that European governments, including the British government, does have a, a strong tendency historically and today to try and appease the Arabs in the Middle East for economic reasons and other reasons. Um, and one can only hope that maybe behind the scenes uh, discussions with Arabs, the Arabs will uh, maybe not in public, but will behind the scenes persuade Western governments in Europe that this is not necessarily in their interest. And the second thing is to appease their populations at home. And in European countries, we now have huge Islamic populations who are bred from birth, in most cases, to hate Israel. They want to see us condemning Israel. Um, it's part of their DNA in many ways. And that's another reason why our governments, I think, find it so hard to stand up and Act honourably in these cases. Yeah, I think here, please, in the middle. Oh, I'm sorry. Did you? Have more? No, I was just going to say. I mean, just really adding on to what Colonel Kemp has said. I think we are quite realistic in the high-level military group that um, we are, in a sense, conducting some form of information operation, if you like, um, shaping the battlefield to get an understanding of the severity of the threat to Israel and what Israel may well have to do, so that there. A, that plays into deterrence, which I think is quite important in its own right, but more, more particularly it plays into an understanding of what might happen and why it might happen. And I think that is a perfectly legitimate thing to do, to get that wider understanding out there. Right here in the middle, please. Ria Kawaji from uh, Enigma in Dubai. Uh, I'm afraid, I mean, the, the way this whole thing is approached um, um, is not going to prove much. Um, I think uh, the matter, what, what we are hearing here, that uh, uh, it is not if there's going to be a third war, but when. And if the way uh, as being uh, presented goes on, we're going to be in a few years talking about meeting again, talking about the fourth Lebanon, Lebanon war, because everybody seems to agree that Iran is the one supplying, ordering, running, organizing, managing, but the field of engagement is outside Iran. It's Lebanon and Syria. So until somebody changes the rule of the game, which by the way was set by Iran since 1983 until today, nothing is going to happen because Israel is going to uh, wage this powerful, mighty war, uh, uh, leave a lot of destruction. Hezbollah, uh, so long as Hezbollah still has some people who can fire a Katyusha at Israel, Hezbollah will proclaim it has won because it withstood all the mighty force of Israel and still endured. So it's going to be just a waste of life, a lot of money, a lot of uh, 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 destruction, without reaching the actual end game here is to defeat Hezbollah. The question, if we're engaging, we want to see an end of this, why are we still playing by the rules of the game set by Iran? Why don't we change the rules and let Iran become directly accountable for the next war in Lebanon. Let's expand. Why don't entertain expanding the battleground to include Iranian territory itself? Then we can be talking about actually changing the rules of the game and getting some results instead of keeping playing the exact 
game that Iran has set outside its territory, let somebody else bleed while it reaps all the gains. Thank you. So should the Israeli Air Force strike Tehran if uh, Hezbollah strikes the Israeli North? Well, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very good question. I mean, we'll, co we'll come to that. I think, I think the way you've argued that is exactly right. And if, if part of the purpose or the outcome of this report <clears throat> is to take the argument to the level that you've just taken it to, for realization to increasingly come that actually Iran is the center of gravity, the Iran is the heart of the, the, heart of the problem, that's where Western governments, other governments, should be focusing their effort. And also not forgetting that there is an opposition within Iran. I think we should be trying to develop that as much as possible to see if there is some potential for a change of attitude, a change of government, a, a, a change of internal understanding in Iran that could be ultimately more beneficial. The specific question uh, was a question that was not answered explicitly when we were conducting our discussions and particularly discussions with the head of the Israeli Air Force, should the Israelis strike Iran. Um, the logical extension of what you've just argued is probably, yes, they should be. Will they? I don't know. But I don't think they completely rule it out. Uh, if I may add one or two points to that. Uh, if you remember what I said early on, what we could do, I put Iran in the first place. So I think we fully understand that we have to address the issue in Iran and with Iran and to make it clear to them that we understand their game and that we want to put pressure on them to change so that we may have a chance to achieve a better result. Um, to, to take military actions against Iran in, in such, a, um, such a conflict on Lebanon would pause, uh, would, uh, would really put us into a very, very difficult dilemma. If we couldn't prove that Iran really triggered the issue, we would launch an aggression against Iran. And I cannot imagine that the international community would be prepared to go along that way. That knows Iran, of course, very well. And they are, they are playing it to the extent possible. But uh, if, we, if we took an action which we, according to our own standards, <coughs> see as not legitimate, I think we would destroy our own uh, basis of action and uh, would put us into an extremely difficult situation. I, I do not see uh, a Western community to be prepared to launch a, a war of aggression against Iran. Uh, Iran would win, eventually. Sorry? Iran would eventually win. No matter what we do, no matter what we give Israel, it's going to be a Lebanon War 3, 4, 5, and eventually Iran will win. With uh, this mentality, this is what's going to happen. I, I, agree, I agree with what both generals said. I also agree with you. And I think um, there's, there is, um, I agree with everybody, basically. There is, <laughs> there is, uh, <laughs> There is more than ample intelligence. I'm, I'm absolutely confident in the hands of the Israelis to, to very closely link the armament of Hezbollah in uh, Lebanon and in Syria to Iran. It can be traced back there, and I have no doubt whatsoever that intelligence would also exist to prove that uh, Iran initiated that aggression. And I, if I was the chief of staff of the IDF, which I will never be, I'm afraid, um, although a British officer was once considered um, as the potential chief of staff of the IDF, who was a chap called Ord Wingate, who b unfortunately was killed in Burma before he could be appointed chief of staff of the IDF, in fact, before the State of Israel was created. But I would certainly be, I would certainly have a plan to attack Iran in the event of um, Hezbollah aggression against Israel from Lebanon. And I'd make sure that Iran knew that, and I think that would be a very significant part of my deterrent policy. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in thanking this panel for a very, very interesting discussion, not only about how to try and preempt a third Lebanon war, but on a great deal of uh, British and European military history. 
Uh, the takeaway is to be very careful when inviting Lord Donat to your home for dinner if you're going to put out the silver. Uh, everybody have a wonderful day. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Sir. Hold on.